it's six o'clock, so we could get started with uh, with Scott. And as people filter in, they can listen. So uh, tonight is um, the Joint Board of Finance Board of Selectmen meeting for the Town of Woodbridge. It is Tuesday, January twenty fifth, and this is a um, a budget presentation meeting. Uh, and the first speaker we have tonight is Scott Bassett, who will go over the uh, FY twenty one audit review. So with that, Scott. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, miss not being at the town hall. So I have my typical presentation this year regarding uh, our audit. Um, and it looked pretty much the same results as, as we always go, go through this process. Um, Tony and the team do a great job. There was some um, turnover at the Board of Ed, um, <laughs> which, um, you know, Al always did a nice job, but we also had a great working experience with the folks over at the Board of Ed in the current year, too, so that there was uh, no hiccups there as we went through the process. Um, we are hired uh, by the Board of Finance to audit the financial statements of the Town of Woodbridge and give an opinion on those financial statements. Um, we, RSM, rendered an un <coughs> unqualified clean opinion on the statements this year, as you've received in the past. There was one new adoption of an accounting standard that had an immaterial impact on the town. And that was um, some reclassification of funds that were formally classified as agency funds, basically under an agency fund assets equals liabilities. Um, the gas came out and changed the format <laughs> in the regard to, so, to have a more revenue expense base. So those that was a small transition and an adjustment um, with the new accounting standard in the current year. We also um, did a state single audit. Um, the town did not have enough expenditures in the current year to qualify for a federal single audit, but I would anticipate with the CARES Act and the related COVID funding um, in 2022 um, that you will have a federal single <laughs> audit in the, in the upcoming year. Um, we did issue the state single audit um, expenditures uh, compared to the prior year did go down because in the prior year, I heard it mentioned in the call, the microgrid was about $3 million. It was a project that we audited um, in the year in the fiscal 2020. Um, our required communications to you, uh, significant accounting policies, which are described in <coughs> one. And I mentioned that there was a small adoption of GASB 84 in the current year. Um, the county estimates, the key estimates um, within the town are the pension plan assumptions used by uh, CMERS, your OPEP plan assumptions, and you do use depreciation as an estimate for your capital assets. Um, there's no difficulties um, encountered um, going through the audit. We had no disagrees, disagreements <laughs> with management, and <clears throat> control weaknesses, and the rep representation letter was signed by management and all parties um, that were required to do so. Um, management is responsible for the uh, preparation and the overall financial statements. We audit those statements and give an opinion on those. And as a Is it just me or did we lose Scott? Yeah, I don't see anything. He's gone. I mean, yeah, 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 we're right. Yeah. yeah. No sound. While we have a break, could I ask everyone who's not muted to mute if you're not speaking? Because it's hard to hear. Please, thanks. Hmm. Is there anybody getting a hold in? I wonder if he realizes he must.
Well, I don't know what we should do here. I have a feeling we've lost him. Tony, are you uh, here? Yeah, I'm trying to contact him. Yeah, and I'll, I'll let you know. If, you know, yeah. if we have to, we could, we could do it Thursday if we have to. Okay. I'll All right, he's going to try to log back in. In the meantime, um, I can go over something for a few minutes, Matt. If, go if, ahead. Karen, if Karen could share my screen. <clears throat> Give me one second. Your name is so far down, I can't get it to you. Bro, bro, hear from Matt. Give me a second. I'm going to do it for Ellen. Then I'm going to pull it down. Okay. Dwight. Oh, I see Scott back on. You back? Yeah. You want to let him continue? Yeah. If he can, if he comes on, you can let him continue. I'll go. I'll just go right after him. Okay. Okay, hey guys. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I actually had to go to my iPad and not my, so I apologize, but okay. Um, where I was, was just kind of giving a highlight of the financial statement results um, on a government wide basis. Um, that position was about $55 million, which was a small increase from the previous year. Your general fund um, on the signed fund balance was $7.3 million, where your total fund balance was 8.3. Um, the unassigned fund balance was 14%. Of general fund expenditures by total fund balance represents 60 percent of the same amount uh, the opeb trust fund had an increase in net position um going from four hundred five million four oh nine to six million seven seven eight the notes to the statements um remained pretty much the same from the previous year um a couple of highlights is that well one highlight is that the the country club fund is no longer a major fund with the pay down of the of the bands in the current year. Um, so that fund you will not see in the financial statements as a major fund. Debt decreased by $1.8 million in the current year. And the net pension liability increased by a million dollars. And your OPEB li liability decreased by a million dollars in the current year. 
the assumptions with the um, with the um, state pension plan remain basically the same since from the last uh, from the last uh, actual evaluation. Um, as I said, that total liability is thirteen point five million dollars. In the OPEB total net net liability is thirteen point nine million dollars. Um, the revenues exceeded the budget by fifty thousand dollars. And actual actual expenditures were under budget by six hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars. And you had state awards, as I said, of only one point three million dollars this year compared to about um, three four point million four million dollars in twenty twenty. And we do take a look at your internal controls and no issues um, to bring to your attention in the current year. Um, so overall, um, a very good audit, very good audit results. Um, we were out in the in the field, um, not 100%. We were there when we had to be, um, and the audit um, went well, and everything we asked for, we were given, and the records were, as usual, in a re really good good form. And so that is my presentation. I'd open it up to any questions. Okay. Anybody have a question for uh, Scott? Anybody? No? Pretty, it's pretty uh, straightforward stuff. So, okay, Scott, thank you very much. And, All right. Uh, good luck. Thank you. See you guys. Thanks, Scott. Take care. Bye. Matt, I, I just want to say thank you to Tony and the finance department for making this part of our evening so easy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. All right. Now we have the Amity Regional School District. Uh, wow, oh, this is Tony. Okay, Tom, go ahead. You see my screen? I do. We do. I guess. So I just want to um, just briefly go over the um, the budget here, the results so far, where we are in the budget process. Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, this is a summary of the uh, requested budget so far. And um, I, I, I sent everyone a, a complete uh, sheet today that outlines this in more detail, but for purposes of the uh, television, I wanted to just summarize this. So um, as you can see, the uh, total expenditure um, uh, requested increase is $5.8 million, which is 11.32%. So if you follow this uh, down, this is a pretty simple way to calculate the uh, tax rate and the mill rate. So um, if we take our expenditures, which uh, in this case is $57.4 million in requested funds, that's how much um, the requests are to operate the government. Uh, we have non-tax revenues of $3.7 million this year. Uh, that's up slightly, which we'll go over next Tuesday from the previous year, which, uh, so if you subtract those from your total expenditures, the amount needed to raise in taxes uh, on the request column is fifty, a little over fifty three point six million dollars, which is um, an additional five point six million dollars in taxes, or eleven point six percent. I highlighted the um, major account groups so you can see where the major account groups are, uh, including the town departments, the capital budget, and both boards of education. Uh, and lastly, uh, this does not have the uh, grand list yet. The grand list is. Uh, not due until um, the 1st. So as soon as Marcia, uh, our town assessor, has that completed, I will incorporate that into the schedule to give you a better idea of where the um, the uh, tax and mill rate will be. Uh, the grand list in this scenario then takes your tax rate or the amount you need to raise in taxes and spreads that out amongst the um, value in the community. So uh, it, if the grand list goes up, there's more value uh, paying the same tax rate. So that's why it's important to have uh, an increase in your grand list if you can. So um, we, Marshall will be in next Tuesday and we can go over the uh, grand list in more detail at that point. I just wanted to sort of give you an idea of where we are to start the process. Okay. Okay. And anybody, anybody on TV watching this, please don't panic. It's, this will never happen. Uh, not even close. So okay. that's, what, that's, that's why we're here. So. Okay. Is uh, Dr. Byers and Terry? I know Terry was here. Is Dr. Byers with us? 
I am. And so yeah. I just need some permission to share my screen. Sure. No mask tonight, huh? Last no, it's time, nice. Last time you look like the Lone Ranger. <laughs> Dr. Burris, you should be all set now. All right, thank you. Okay, we got it. All right, and let me just, okay. All right, well, thank you. Um, I appreciate both Matt and um, Beth welcoming us here tonight. And, um, I, you know, I'm gonna skip through the first few slides, which is sort of the concept of what an Amity education um, purchases for you. I will hit a couple of highlights, but we'll really dive into the budget piece in an effort to save time this evening. <coughs> Um, I will say that in the past, we've always started with our Board of Education goals, but I am very pleased this year that we are starting with our portrait of our graduate. Um, the portrait of the graduate is currently still in a draft process, but it was developed with um, input from over 10,000 data points that we received from our um, citizens from the communities of Bethany, Orange, and Woodbridge. And ultimately, a Board of Education budget for Amity should be aimed at um, developing, cultivating, and ultimately achieving what our communities expect for our graduates when they exit Amity Regional um, School District and particularly our high school. Um, we also sort of always address the three A's um, upon which Amity prides itself. Um, in the area of academics, again, I'll just highlight a couple of things. Um, obviously, um, the number of advanced placement classes that we offer, as well as the number of advanced placement enrollments, um, our early um, college experience, our pre-apprenticeship program, which is now entering into its third year, our um, commended national and um, recognized um, uh, semifinalists for National Merit Scholarship, and our student-driven organizations and clubs. Um, as far as academics go, we still maintain a very high um, four-year graduation rate. What we have seen a shift in in the past two years is the percentage of students who elect for a military work or gap year. That has increased um, at essentially the expense of four-year schools. Um, obviously, we believe that COVID is driving that as students are still trying to figure out what exactly to do um, when colleges and universities don't function in the way that they traditionally did. Um, our current senior class has already um, had um, reported admissions of 101 students. That was back in December when this presentation was originally um, put together. But um, we've also had um, approaching 2,000 regular decision applications um, submitted by our students. In terms of state assessment performance data um, across the state of Connecticut, we saw decreases in performance in most of the state assessments. Um, but Amity still continues to perform significantly above state averages. Um, and that is uh, true in um, almost all of the areas of um, English language arts, math, and science. Athletics is the second of our three A's. And um, despite the fact that we, again, were operating in COVID, and many of our um, teams did not have um, winter or fall state championships, as well as a couple of our teams just never operated at all. We were still able to successfully bring home um, SCC championships, runners ups and divisional championships. We continue that into the current school year. Um, our athletes and coaches are also recognized um, on both a state as well as an area level. Um, I would point out this fall, we've already had 24 all-league student athletes, 10 all-state student athletes, and one all-New England student athlete. Additionally, this is the sixth year we have been recognized as a Class Act Sportsmanship recipient by the CIAC, meaning that not just our athletes are exceptional individuals, but our, um, the supporters of athletics and our fans are exceptional students and representatives of our three towns. In the area of the arts, again, we have um, faced the challenges of COVID and have done that very well. Um, as far as musical arts, um, we have continued to have success in our regional auditions, despite the fact that adjudications have been canceled. And as we sort of got into the swing of this school year, we have been able to sort of 
I would say successfully returned to our expectations of community performances for our winter concerts, as well as some of our seminal events, such as Music in Motion um, and uh, some of our band and choir performances. In visual arts, um, we have had uh, several recognitions at the national level, including Riley Palazzo's self-portrait that you see on the left, which is currently hanging in Congresswoman Rosa Dolores um, Washington DC office as she won second place in the Congressional Arts Competition last year. And in performing arts, uh, true to form, Amity Creative Theater has continued to have um, widely recognized state success, having won the um, 2021 uh, Sondheim Award for Best Musical, which uh, due to um, the support of the Amity Board of Education, we were able to perform outside under the tent in our parking lot behind the school. We've also been able to successfully stage our Moana Junior performance at AMSB, are preparing for the uh, spring Mary Poppins Junior at AMSO, and did finish the um, winter play um, for Amity Creative Theater called Puffs. And I'll put a shameless plug in for Mama Mia, which will be coming this spring to Amity Regional High School. The budgeting process, um, you see this slide every single year. Those of you who have been here for a long time, and I do see many familiar faces are familiar with it. We are essentially at line three, where I have a recommended budget, but where we also know that we are going to continue to look for possible reductions before presenting a final budget to the Board of Education in March. <coughs> We'll cut right to the chase. The current um, budget is a 4.92% increase over the, um, uh, sorry, the, the next year's budget is a proposed 4.92% increase over the current year's budget. Um, the town allocations you see don't work out quite so cleanly. That is due to enrollment that we will look at at the end, as well as what we anticipate as declining revenue, um, particularly in the area of special education. We have several budget drivers. Um, contractual increases are always a budget driver, as and then we will look um, into the details of some of these other areas in the next slides. Uh, so again, um, salaries and benefits, which are the two big items that are identified in our contracts, account for about two thirds of our budget. Um, because those are contractual, those are things that we do not really have a whole lot of wiggle room around. It's part of maintaining a workforce that is largely personnel dependent. The other thing I will point out, of course, is that debt service is not something that you will see carried on a, um, say, on Beecher's budget because the town assumes the debt service for the uh, school district um, since it's a school district located within the town and not a regional district. If you look over a 10-year history, um, this is pretty much part of one of our challenges contractual increases. So what we are paying uh, primarily to our staff, but also to some of our larger contracts, such as um, transportation or food service, have remained fairly consistently at about two and a half percent over the last 10 years. Most of our budgets during that time period have been below that two and a half percent, which means cost savings and efficiencies, as well as reductions and cuts, we have essentially actualized. And so at some point you can only maintain for so long um, budget increases that are less than those contractual increases without drastically impacting programming or the services that our communities expect from the Amity Regional School District. Second large piece of our budget that is um, being influenced this year are our health insurance trends. And again, this isn't something that I think we are surprised at. Um, if you've been paying attention to Amity Finance Committee meetings, we've been talking about this for a while. Um, at this point in um, the 21-22 uh, uh, school year, our claims are approaching 60% over the prior year. Um, large claims are driving this spike. So if you look, you can see that over the past three years, we've averaged around 11 to 12 claims with a aggregate spend of about 1.3 million. At the midpoint of this year, we already have 10 claims with an aggregate spend of, a, of um, a million. So if we keep going on this rate annualized, we are probably looking at 20 high cost claimants with an estimated outlay of $2 million. All of this information is going to impact what um, we have to look at for insurance costs for next year. 
So currently in the budget, we, are, um, we have an 11% medical rate increase. Based on the information that we have, if we look at the rolling 12-month estimate, we have to consider a potential 14% increase. And um, as we talk to our um, insurance consultants, who I will stress are separate from Anthem, who provides our insurance, um, we are still considering whether we even have to look at something higher um, or land somewhat in the middle. So um, I will point out that current, again, currently the 11% is what is resulting partially to the 4.92% budget. In the past, we have often used the time between January and March, and this percentage increase has decreased because our claims have been lower than what we anticipated. We are not seeing that trend right now, which somewhat makes sense given the um, way people are responding to healthcare as we come out of the COVID um, uh, pandemic. So we are actually looking at what the impact might be if we have to increase our medical rate up to 14, 17, or potentially 20%. And so you can see how that would um, possibly affect the bottom line of the budget. So that's still one of those works in progress, um, but it's something that we are keenly attuned to at this time. Pupil services, or more commonly called special education, also has several major fiscal impacts, including a rising outplacement. So this will come off the books in one of our elementary districts and go on to the books in Amity. Um, it is through the IEP process and it is not something that we actually have much um, uh, say over. We have a residential placement. We have some rising behavioral therapy needs um, as well as some additional legal costs amounting to about a half a million dollars that we have in additional pupil services expenses. I will say though that our special education department um, has been absolutely stellar in forming in-house programs that ultimately re uh, result in a cost savings. Um, it started with our sales um, uh, program, which in next year's budget has an operating of expense of about $280,000. But if all of those students in sales couldn't come to Amity and had to go to an out of district placement, they would actually cost the district close to $800,000. After the development of sales, we formed the Amity Transition Academy. Again, in the operating budget, it runs about $270,000. If those students had to go to an out of district placement, it would be close to half a million dollars of the operating budget. And finally, this year is our first year of running the Spartan Prep program. It is our program for emotionally disturbed students at the middle school level. It um, is in the operating budget for $133,000, which if those students were also required to be um, placed out of district would result in a half a million dollar um, uh, uh, impact. The reason why I share this with you is I know that we have been scrutinized for adding additional staff despite declining enrollments, but much of that additional staff has come in the special education teachers, the clinicians, the paraeducators and the job coaches that are required to run these programs, which ultimately result in less money being spent to provide the services we are required to provide, as well as keeping students who are children of Bethany, Orange, and Woodbridge in the school district that they are supposed to be in. With that proposed, um, we are um, proposing a new program, which is the Spartan Prep Academy for grades 9 through 12. So essentially the program that we have for emotionally disturbed students in the middle schools is going to have to roll up to the high school. Um, in order to provide that program, we would be looking at the addition of a new special education teacher, a new mental health clinician, as well as an administrative assistant to help with the um, IEPs and the PPTs that are connected to this program. The total cost of this to our budget is $188,000. If we were not to have this, we have to kind of estimate the um, out of district placement costs, but let's say it's around 400,000. So to put it very bluntly, if a budget were to cut these three proposed positions, we would actually be increasing our budget um, request as opposed to decreasing the budget request. Technology also continues to be a fiscal impact. Um, obviously COVID forced us to be very um, quick on our implementation of our one-to-one -one digital learning environment. 
We have current devices in grades 8, 9, 11, and 12 that we still have existing lease payments on, as well as the new devices that we add every three years for grades 7 and 10 uh, that we would have new payments on. Uh, what we are seeing as well are um, staff requests for specialized lab replacements. Those would be labs for, say, visual arts or perhaps CTE. Um, our Promethean boards are what would be more commonly known as smart boards. We're all purchased at about the same time, approximately, say, eight to nine years ago. And um, not surprisingly, they're all failing at approximately the same time. So we had many requests for Promethean boards this year because the ones we currently have are not working. The other interesting thing is that um, the ability to secure um, the, the chips and the supply chain of these smart boards has actually resulted in most of them doubling in cost since last school year. So it has a significant impact on the budget, both the numbers that we need, as well as the, um, the inflation that has occurred around certain types of technology. Um, I point out our textbook fiscal impact because this has often been a well that we have gone to where we have either purchased um, textbooks with end of year funds or simply cut them from the budget. Um, and next year's textbook request is actually a decrease from the current school year. So in other words, this is not a well that we can turn to if we are looking for budget reductions. And it's also um, less than what we had in our textbook forecast um, as we start to transition to um, more online versions of the resources that we need for teaching and learning. So when we talk about the personnel fiscal impact, the three positions sort of at the top above the line we already talked about, that is for the Spartan Prep program for grades nine through 12. So I'm really gonna highlight the four that are below the line. Um, we are requesting one additional um, information security support technician. Um, we have noticed an increasing number of cybersecurity attacks on our district. I believe in the past two years, we've had three, all of which have cost, um, could have cost the district a significant amount of money to um, follow those um, attacks through and um, perform the unnecessary repairs. Fortunately, we have cybersecurity insurance, and so that has actually mitigated the impact of these costs. However, um, in order to maintain the cybersecurity insurance, um, our insurer is telling us that we really do need to have a dedicated personnel um, who is going to be um, paying close attention to cybersecurity attacks, an actual person main, uh, you know, with eyes on the screens and the servers. Um, so essentially it's a wash because if you figure the insurance saves us about $55,000, the cost of the technician is close to that, but it will allow us to continue to purchase cybersecurity insurance without which we could have some significant costs, um, unanticipated costs to the district. We are also looking to hire an additional school security officer at the high school. Uh, you may, may remember a couple of years ago, we added Sally ports to all three of our schools. And when we added Sally Part Ports um, in the middle schools, we added an additional security officer. So that way there could be one person sitting in essentially the booth to um, control the people who come in and out of the school, and a second person kind of wandering through the hallways watching um, for what our student um, students were doing. We did not add that personnel to the high school. So essentially we took the three people who were in the hallways and checking the, the laboratories and the restrooms and the bathrooms and locker rooms um, and put one of them in the booth and now had two people want, walking through the hallways. Um, I don't think you need to be terribly um, ensconced in education to read the news that our young people uh, these days are not making some of the best choices with TikTok challenges, with um, uh, increased instances of vaping, with just overall um, poor choices. Um, I don't want to be alarmist, but we certainly all remember the incidents that happened in Michigan. So the idea is to restore the high school to having three school security officers who are actively monitoring our hallways and our um, instructional spaces while we have the one person operating the Sally Port to monitor those individuals who are coming in and out of our building. Uh, we are also looking to add two um, teachers, one to each of our middle schools to enhance our elective program. Um, so currently um, we have moved, um, when we reduced and, sorry, when we implemented, 
implemented Reader's Workshop last year and reduced the literacy out of our rounds, we actually put general music into the rounds, which from a philosophical standpoint, we believe is the right thing for middle school students. They should have a balanced education that includes visual arts, musical arts, uh, career and technical education, as well as health. So those are our rounds. Um, what this resulted in, though, is that students who needed a course opposite our health and PE had three choices, and it was band, choir, or Mandarin. So what we have found is that students who are not interested in music or who are not interested in Mandarin really don't have any other options of classes to take. And not every student that comes through our doors has a proclivity for Mandarin or music. So at this point, we currently have 131 students across both middle schools who are in a study hall because there is no other elective or choice for them. There are probably more students who have been forced into an elective or choice that they don't really want. So the idea would be to add a middle school teacher who would specialize in aspects of multimedia and digital content creation that is aligned to CTE classes that are offered at the high school that will then provide an elective choice and a more comprehensive middle school education than what we are currently providing to our students when we actually end up putting them into a study hall because there is no better option for them. I'll skip over the course description, but at some point you can have a copy of the presentation and you can certainly read that. <coughs> Excuse me, the last personnel um, that is in addition to the budget is a diversity, equity, and inclusion instructional coach. Uh, the purpose of this instructional coach will be to plan and deliver um, professional learning related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and inclusion for both our teachers as well as our non-certified staff, to provide direct um, in-classroom hands-on coaching to teachers related to best practices around DEI, to help with the curriculum equity audits that we have already started in English and social studies, but that need to continue into all content areas of um, our program of studies, to support our Spartan seminar and middle school advisory advisors in the development of student lessons related to DEI, to provide the special programming um, for our students in the area of DEI, to continue to look at data related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to um, co-facilitate and participate in our district's DEI committee. The personal impact of this position is that half of it is already funded through ARP ESSER funds. So we are really looking to add a 0 0.5 um, teacher because the other piece is uh, grant funded at least for the next school year. Our capital improvement plan, of course, is part of this. Um, and gratefully, because of the generosity of the Board of Education, we've been able to set, set aside 1% um, for the past two years. So we've been able to do a lot of um, CNR work through that 1% CNR reserve, which means that we have not had to have quite the impact on the operating budget. Um, we are looking at some sort of um, uh, ongoing repairs with window film and asphalt repair as well as a repair to the courtyard at the middle school in Bethany and some chilled water line replacements. We are looking to do some HVAC work and cleanup of the culverts in the athletic fields using bond surplus left from the HVAC and athletic stadium uh, bond that we have. And our CNR account is um, really targeted to remodel our lecture hall at the middle at the high school which has not been updated or renovated since 1996 and is currently a large unusable space in the high school. And then we are hoping for a reimbursement from a security grant so that we can continue our purchase of additional security cameras, as well as upgrading the cameras that we have. Looking long-term, um, the patio in front of the high school, sort of outside of the cafeteria doors where we are pretty much holding lunches during nice weather um, so our students can be outside and socially distance um, is in desperate need of a repair. It's a concrete patio and it's just showing its wear and tear. We'll need to do some uh, corridor flooring replacement as well as replacing some of the lines um, for the gas um, in our science labs. We're looking at a couple of um, improvements to our athletic um, complex, including warning tracks, bleachers, um, long-term lighting, and then we know we have a 10-year um, planned replacement for the all-weather field. 
Um, and then uh, looking, anticipating, hopefully, um, additional CNR money. Um, new musical instruments for the middle school has been on our budget wish list for as long as I've been making these budget presentations. So I will say four years and those instruments are not getting any younger or any more usable. Um, we would like to update our library media centers to be a little bit more reflective of 21st century education and would like to continue to improve roof, roof drainage and gutters so that we do not have any major um, roofing bonding projects coming forward in the future. Our debt service, you can see, um, was minimally impacted uh, due to the um, very uh, fortunate rates we received for the athletic and HVAC um, bond that we received. And you can see in um, the year 2025, our debt service starts to, sorry, 2024, our debt service starts to significantly uh, fall off and then um, really decrease in 2025. Um, we always include this as part of our budget packet that we may consider um, appropriating 2% of the current year, the 21-22 operating budget to CNR um, funds for future capital items. So you will notice this in the budget packet. Um, the other reason why I draw attention to this is that traditionally um, this was statutorily limited to 1% until last year at which point a correction of an oversight um, allowed regional boards of education to be on parity with local boards of education to reserve 2%. Um, last year, our board did only vote um, with support from the AFC to um, keep 1%. Um, however, again, this is sort of more of a um, statement of possibility, not of probability, uh, in terms of what would happen with remaining funds from the current year's budget. Initially, our budget requests were slightly over 7%. Um, through our discussions, as well as um, further analysis of the budget, we were able to bring it down to the 5.4 and ultimately the 4.92% increase that um, is being presented to you today. Um, part of the reason why the change doesn't sort of work out evenly as 4.92% across the board is, of course, due to enrollment. Um, you will notice that everybody is showing a declining enrollment. Um, however, Bethany's is significantly going down more than that of Warren, Orange and Woodbridge, which is why their percent of change is going to be um, much more moderate than that seen in the other two towns. Which again brings us to the actual allocations for the towns, Bethany's being slightly under 1%, Orange and Woodbridge being over 6%. Um, and our revenue being um, adversely impacted by what we see is, is not um, receiving some education um, funding for special education. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the amount of um, uh, money that was just returned during this past month to the towns. Much of this excess surplus was a result of operating our school district um, last year in um, a, a COVID world. Uh, where we had far fewer students at school and couldn't run programs, whether it was athletics or hands-on science instruction or field trips in a way we would traditionally anticipate. Uh, so that money has been returned to the towns. Um, and obviously we are in the midst of our finance presentations, uh, this evening being our second one. Uh, we'll be in Bethany in February and the presentation to the Amity Board of Education on Valentine's Day. And so that's it. Thank you very much for listening. And both Ms. Loomis and I would be happy to answer questions. Hey, thank you. It was very comprehensive. Um, any questions? Just let uh, Jen or um, Terry know. I, I did have um, just two quick questions. First, I want to thank you, Dr. Byers. Very informative presentation, as always. Um, I had a question about guidance counselors. I happened to tune into the Orange Board of Finance meeting last night, and I heard that there was some discussion there. But I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about um, why the number of guidance counselors for the current student population may be different than what we've had in the past when the guidance counselor's role might have been slightly different. They're not simply preparing kids to apply for colleges, but can you speak to what the guidance counselors are facing at Amity and why you have them at the the number of guidance counselors you have? 
Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. McCreven. So um, first of all, our guidance counselors are contractually limited to the number of students that they can service. Um, and I believe Mr. Leahy was misinformed last night when he said they can serve 250 students because in the contract they are allowed a maximum cap of 220 students. So if you consider our middle schools alone, when we have you know, somewhere around say 375 kids, each middle school automatically defaults to having two guidance counselors um, because that they, they, just fits the contract. Um, I believe that Mr. Houlihan was also misinformed when he said we had 10 school counselors because we actually have nine. And so again, the nine school counselors are appropriate to the contract. However, even as I'm speaking, you'll notice I changed the term from guidance counselor to school counselor, because what our school counselors are doing um, is much more than just advising students on the courses they need to take and their pathway to go to a four-year college. Um, I, we are seeing a significant increase in the number of our students who are experiencing anxiety, depression, um, mental illness, um, and our school counselors run uh, both individual counseling sessions as well as group therapy to help our students uh, deal with the mental stress and trauma that they're experiencing at this moment. Um, we have over the past two years, um, with the support of the Board of Education, also added social workers. Um, so we now have a social worker in each of our middle schools as well as two in our high schools because the need for mental health counseling that we are witnessing in the school at this time is fairly significant. We just completed our signs of suicide um, uh, assessment for our seventh graders. And just to give you a data point of the seventh graders who are assessed at Bethany Middle School, 35 of them came through as in need of support that we were able to provide additional support for and identify if they were at risk for harm to themselves um, going forward. So that's the role we're facing right now. So I believe there was some misinformation in the numbers last night, but at the same time, there is a very significant need for mental health support that we have in our schools at this time. Thank you. That, that's very helpful context for us to consider. And then lastly, I was just wondering if you could send over to us any enrollment projections that you have updated, especially with regard to that average daily balance uh, or average daily attendance number and how it's shifting or projected to shift between Bethany, Woodbridge and Orange going forward helps us to prepare and share with the elementary district as well. So if you could send so it when you get it. We'll yeah. be sure to get that too. She'll probably send it to Mr. Giglietti and he can then disperse it accordingly. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm going to jump in with a question. I don't see Matt at this moment. Uh, thank you, Dr. Byers. That was that was very interesting in many respects. I just want one quick question with respect to health, health insurance and health costs. You said um, it's people responding to healthcare as we come out of the pandemic. And I just would appreciate if you could just explain what you meant by that. So what we believe we've seen, and, and I can let Ms. Loomis, <coughs> excuse me, jump in, is that a lot of people um, deferred um, medical care during the period of the COVID pandemic. Um, at some points, because hospitals were not doing uh, particular types of surgeries because they were simply managing the number of sick and ill individuals coming through. Um, other times people were, I think, a little reluctant to go to hospitals because there was a certain fear of uh, becoming ill by going into the place where the most uh, uh, severe uh, COVID patients were. So we have definitely seen a shift in people performing not what I would call elective surgeries, but non-emergency surgeries and non-emergency health care. And so that is most definitely driving our health care costs, as well as the number of people who are hitting some of these um, higher thresholds. So Ms. Loomis, I don't know if you have anything that you want to add to that. Uh, no, that pretty much sums it up. Um, you know, we did see a decline you know, certainly in the last quarter of the fiscal year of 2020, when, you know, virtually people couldn't go access the medical care unless it was an emergency, and then more or less expected it to uh, come back in 2021. And it really, um, it started to, but then with each of these variants, I think it it makes um, certain populations just pause again. And as Dr. Byers said, not necessarily urgent care or elective, but 
something that, you know, you, you can make that decision, I can wait a few months. Um, and now we're seeing that, um, knowing by the number of staff that are out um, on leave and different things and the claims we're seeing that people are going back and, and seeking those treatments. Thank you. Thank you both. Well, can, can I, this is uh, Tom Handler, can I ask a couple more questions about healthcare? And I'm probably confused, so hopefully you will help me out. Um, first of all, thank you for a really good presentation. My understanding is Amity is self-insured, so Anthem administers, but it's not like a traditional insurance and that you have been appropriately putting money aside, anticipating um, the need you know, to, to have claims. So during COVID, there was a dramatic, I believe, a dramatic decrease in, in utilization, which allowed that balance to go up. Um, and then if you do have lots of claims in a given year, you have, um, I think it's, what is it, overage insurance, you know, so that if you have more than a certain amount of claims, you are protected. Um, so in a traditional insurance role, right, we're, we're seeing increases in premiums, but you don't really have premiums as such, right? Anthem doesn't charge you for, you know, what they anticipate you're going to be spending. Um, so can you just correct me if I'm wrong here on, on what I just said? Ms. You Lemus, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> um, so um, yes, we are self-insured. Um, and what that means is uh, for the employees, they have the same benefit coverage as if we were fully insured. Um, what it means for us with an Anthem is that we pay the actual claims. So instead of paying that monthly premium for, you know, 250, 300 employees, we pay the actual claims that they incur. So it's not a smooth every month. It's the same amount. Um, it's it, it rises and falls. And yes, we did um, have an increase to our reserve when we didn't have those claims and we anticipated it. That was during 2021 when we first expected to see that. And then uh, for the current budget that we're working off of 21-22, we lowered our reserve back down from 30% down to 22%, which is one reason why you see such a change in the insurance, the medical line from year to year, because we really lowered the reserve back down um, from our typical 25% to a recommended 22% at the, at the board's request. Um, so that's our reserve that should we go um, over the aggregate. So there's there's two stop losses. So one, we would cover everybody's, any high claimants cost up to $150,000. And our concern now is that we have, the, we have a number of people approaching that uh, stop loss threshold at the midpoint of the year, where we typically see this number of people by the end of the year. Um, there's also an aggregate stop loss so that, you know, we have to get to a certain point overall in the group. So meaning that doesn't mean, you know, so many people are hitting the stop loss. It just means there could be a lot of people with a lot of claims, um, not necessarily high, but just an, an exorbitant number of claims across the group. So um, we do have some um, coverages for those scenarios, but we have um, set those rates at a point where the cost of having those fees are uh, manageable. So we incur a certain amount before we hit those buffers. Thank you, that was helpful. Okay, hey, anybody else? Uh, hi, Matt, I had a couple of questions. Um, on page 11, there's a bar graph that shows the salaries and it shows the benefits and the benefits are higher than the salaries. Can you explain why that is? It's just the uh, percentage of increase over the line items. So, and and that kind of goes to what I just referred to is because we had brought the current budget down for medical, um, that it, it seems like a larger increase this year. And then if you're adding new staff, the new staff that we proposed, all of those people would be entitled to benefits that are not currently on our benefit plan. So that would also drive up the medical. Yeah, the pie graph though showed 11% as a benefit number. 
That's the that's the cost of just the medical treatment. So if if everybody had the same exact treatments next year as they have this year, and we had the same number of people with the same type of coverage, there'd be an 11% increase because Anthem would charge us more for those procedures. So that's one piece of it. And then the other factors are the additional staff. And, and, and the, pie, the pie graph to which you're referring to is that 11% of our, if you look at our budget as 100%, 11% of it is just medical benefits that we're obligated to pay because of the contracts that we have. Uh, the second question I had was on um, special education reimbursement. That amount has been uh, constantly falling and our enrollment of special education students has not to my knowledge been falling. Is that correct? Um, has anybody gone up to Hartford and lobbied for res restoration of some of that money? Well, part of the reason why the um, revenue falls for us is if you put in, and I'm going to just use very rough numbers, Ms. Loomis might be more precise about this, but if you put a student in an out-of-district placement that costs $300,000, you're going to actually recoup a certain amount of money from the state that goes past a threshold. When we bring that student back to us in district, it may cost us a fraction of that $300,000, but we don't get any, any revenue from the state for that. So you will actually see as we bring students back into our in-district programs, the revenue falls down, but the total cost that we have put out for that student is still lower by bringing, this, bringing the student to an in-district program than it ever would have been to send that student to an out-of-district program and still get a percentage of the state's reimbursement. Right, that, that's for that, that piece of it, but um, hasn't there been a, re, a reduction of a reimbursement for the small towns and having that money uh, be redistrib redistributed to the cities? It's been fairly consistent around 73, 74% over the past, I would say five or six years. Uh, there's talk of always readjusting that formula, but as of right now, I'm not aware of any adjustment that is taking place in the current year or for next year. The, the special education reimbursement rate is, is applied fairly consistently across the towns. Some of the other um, rates, particularly you may be thinking of Alliance District funding, that defi most definitely goes more towards cities and does not go towards towns um, or, or small municipalities, but that's something completely different from our special education reimbursement rate. Okay, thank you. And, and just to answer your question, as far as lobbying, the superintendent's group lobbies the state all the time to fix state funding formulas for funding education. <laughs> all right, thank you. Good to know. Okay, anybody else? Hearing none, Terry and Dr. Byers, thank you very much. Thank much you. Shorter, much shorter night for you. Yes. Thank <laughs> you, we appreciate it. And you're already, and you're already home too. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Have a good night. Take care. Okay, next up is the uh, Woodbridge Board of Ed. Um, again, I have a lot of pictures here. Okay, that's Dr. Bud. I guess you're making the presentation, correct? Ms. Piazic is right before me. Do you see her? All right, go right ahead. Get started. Hi, Matt. Thank you. Good evening. Oh, Thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to meet with all of you this evening. Uh, for those of you that may not know me, my name is Lynn Piazic, and I am honored to serve as the chair of the Woodbridge Board of Education. To remind you, the vision of the Woodbridge School District is to provide a dynamic educational environment that challenges and empowers students to persevere as innovators, and collaborators in preparation for their role as responsible global citizens. Today, Beecher Road School is providing quality educational experiences to 863 students from pre-K through grade six, 26 more than last year at this time um, when I spoke with you. 
As a Board of Education member, as the current board chair, and as a former Beecher Road School teacher for many decades, I believe that the budget you will see this evening meets the vision and goals of the district in addition to addressing the high expectations of the Woodbridge community in maintaining excellence in education. Tonight, you will see in Dr. Bud's presentation a budget that reflects a 13.52% increase. In large part, this proposed increase reflects expenses required by contract or statute and oftentimes unfunded state mandates. It is based on known circumstances at this particular moment in time. Salaries and benefits represent over 81% of the entire budget. This year, one of the most significant budget drivers is an 18.3% increase in employee benefits that includes medical insurance premiums. It should be noted that the Board of Education is the only town department that includes employee benefits incorporating medical, unemployment, compensation, FICA, MRF, life insurance in its operating budget. This portion of the proposed school budget represents a 4.9% increase to the overall proposed budget increase. I can assure you that work is being done in this area in an attempt to achieve some savings, but at this point in time, our proposal reflects the reality of increasing benefit costs that I'm sure you keep hearing about. 94.8% of the proposed budget represents costs that are either contractual or fixed, such as utilities and bus transportation. This portion of the buzz budget will rise 14.1%. The remaining 5.2% of our budget costs include materials and supplies, such as library books, digital subscriptions, furniture and computer replacement, substitutes, professional development, and this portion of the budget will rise 3.3% overall. There is no doubt that quality education demands highly trained and effective professionals who continually work at improving their craft and instructional competencies. Quality education also requires a safe, healthy, and clean environment and quality education is dependent on having the resources and materials to provide enriching experiences and materials. Education has always been a cherished value for the citizens of Woodbridge with the expectation that the district will constantly build on its successes. That's what we have done at Beecher Road School year after year and what we strive to continue to do in the future. As the district's mission and vision directs, this budget plan will indeed support the academic, emotional, social, and physical needs of our students in order to prepare them for a successful future. And so now Dr. Budd will share with you the Woodbridge School District's proposed operating budget for fiscal year 2022-2023. And I'm I was totally ready to rest on that, Lynn. Nothing more to be said, no, okay. So it's wonderful to see you all this evening, and I'm going to share my screen, please. Just give me a moment. Uh, Mr. Giglietti, you're on my screen. Can you just give a thumbs up if you can see that presentation? And I, Okay. It is a pleasure to be back with you, everybody, this year. And in the past year, it has been confirmed over and over again that although we don't necessarily all sit at the same board meetings all the time, we all share a common goal, continuing the town's decades-long investment in strong education here in the pre-K-6 district that is represented at Beecher Road School. My job tonight is to advocate for you the budget that's been unanimously endorsed by our Board of Education to answer questions about it and to be the interpreter between the town boards as the boards play different and important roles. I have seven parts to tonight's presentation, and I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. Some of you like the dollars and cents. Some of you like the bigger picture ideas of the great things happening at Beecher. 
Let me start with the objective. This Board of Education unanimously recommends this budget to maintain the excellence of Beecher within a time of escalating student needs, including those related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Byers spoke about the uh, escalating student needs at the middle and high school level, and I would say we see the same, actually even more, at the elementary school level. But this objective comes in a context. And what is that context? First of all, we have a constitutional mandate, as you know, to meet general education needs in a variety of ways, from curriculum to transportation, all sorts of uh, obligations that the state government imposes on us, many of which are excellent obligations. But I'm not the first person to say in this meeting tonight, they are sometimes unfunded mandates or the funding for them has to come from the local district. And that brings us here tonight. There are also very important mandates in the field of special education. Dr. Byers, Ms. Loomis spoke about that in relation to a question a few minutes ago. Uh, these mandates are sometimes partially funded by the state government or the federal government, and more comes back upon the local district. But I want to point out that in this slide's definition and on the previous, it speaks about child and children. And everything we're going to talk about in this budget has an impact on the 860 some odd children and their families who rely on Beecher Road School each and every day to prepare them for a future that is, as of yet, rather undefined for them. Lynn read our mission and vision. These are important mission and vision statements for us because every child is different. And when our children enter in kindergarten on that very first day, we don't know which of them will be a poet, which will be a scientist, which will be the next doctor, attorney, which will be the next members of this board of selectmen. But we need to educate them all as strong as possible in all sorts of different ways for the future that is theirs. Now, some of you like my visuals a lot, so a few photos on the next pages. And you can't come into Beecher really very well right now as visitors, so I have to bring it to you. If you can't see that mural well, you'd see it on our main entrance with Hoot the Owl. Who chooses love? Beecher does. You say, why do I start with that photo? Each of us was four, five, six, seven, eight years old at one time. And our prior generations took time to make sure that the social and emotional learning each of us had in school was quite significant. And we, as the caption says, are the foundation of kindness for children's most formative years that cannot be replaced. See here, other aspects of our district. We see here play. We see the arts. We are about the entire picture of every child to prepare that child for the success in grades 7 through 12, but also for the next 50 years of their lives. This picture comes from Woodbridge Like Me Day in 2021. We're very proud of the display based uh, that came from our Community and Diversity Committee. But we embrace each and every child uniquely here at Beecher. And our initiatives here at the school for decades have been designed to treat each child like the unique youngster he or she is. And you know, we also care about academics. I'm not going to read these bullets to you, but I'll give you the theme. We were, in a year very challenged by the pandemic last year, one of the top three performing districts in the state of Connecticut in language arts, mathematics, and science. That is strong testament to the work of our teachers, our support staff, our administrators, our families, and ultimately our students. But you could say, here are our results on this page. Here are our results. And finally, many, most of our students go to Region 5 Amity after they leave Beecher. Some go to other institutions. We're preparing the seeds now for everything that will happen in their futures. This is a beautiful picture from grade six graduation last year. Okay, so we've sold you, I hope, on the value that is Beecher, but we need to translate that into some dollars. So this particular proposed budget is organized from our board's perspective around 
three main goals. We are continuing to maintain the strength of programs for children, all the way from reading and writing through the visual arts and world language education and everything in between. Each of those elements vital to each child's success. We are continuing to support all learners in their growth. And we have a diverse range. We have students who need special education services, students who are learning English for the first time, students who need social and emotional support now more than ever, and students who need a diff additional differentiation in the upper grades because they've already exceeded grade level standards. These students need and deserve enrichment and gifted programming. And finally, the third goal is about our continuing to develop the strongest, most consistent curriculum so that our students have the benefit of the best practices and the most up-to-date methodology implemented in their classrooms. Okay, that's the background. Now let's talk about the budget categories. Now, this graph illustrates quite vividly that employee benefits and salaries are approximately 82% of our budget. And the other categories are smaller amounts, such that when you take the top four categories of our budget together, they represent 95% of the total. And many of you are very familiar with what these categories mean, but what we pay our staff, the benefits we give them, and then other purchased services and purchased property services are 95%. Other purchased services refers to bus transportation, the fuel for our buses, various other insurances like workers' compensation insurance. Purchased property services, in large part, refers to utilities. And this is a good time for me to note, you have, I believe, the line item budget, and all of these numbers correspond to the different categories you see uh, in the line item budget. This 95% represents almost exclusively costs that are contractual or fixed in other ways, which leaves the other categories to be the remaining 5%. And many of these categories include things that aren't optional either. For example, paying for substitute teachers when our teachers must be out, paying for supplies that are needed for teaching, uh, paying a subsidy for the nurse at Ezra Academy as required by state statute. So I would argue that this 5% has elements that aren't contractual or fixed, but they're not discretionary in any district but they're definitely not discretionary in a district that is as strong as the Woodbridge District has been for decades. Having established these categories and their relative importance, I want to show you how they are growing, speaking first of the biggest segments of our budget. As you see there, uh, we have increases of single or double digits projected in each of the four categories that are the majority of our budget. So this 95% is slated to rise 14.1% based on the contractual and fixed obligations. And I'll break this down in more detail first uh, in a moment, but wanted to show you first some of the more global picture. And so when we get to the other categories that make up 5% of the budget, these are going up only 3.3%. And reductions are not recommended, frankly, because there aren't a lot more dollars left in these categories. And what's left is really, we would argue, about the minimal that is actually required. Now, how does this translate into what the major drivers are? In the salaries increase, there are seven major drivers, and I will take each of them in turn. First, we have contractual salary increases applied to our existing staff. Uh, most of our employees uh, belong to one of four collective bargaining associations. Three of those four contracts are already set for next year, and the fourth with our paraprofessionals is in negotiations now chart shows you the certified staff over the past three years broken <clears throat> excuse me broken up by category 
these categories match the categories in the line item budget. Now, you will see last year, if you look at the bottom row, 90.8, there was an increase. This predates me slightly, but there was an increase of teachers to deal with the pandemic. We, we have come back from that at 84 and a half certified teachers and administrators this year, and we are requesting some additions to take us to 88.8. .8. And I'll speak about those in a moment. But applying the salary contractual increases to the existing staff, that alone is one major driver. A second major driver is that we project we will need an additional classroom teacher based on projected enrollment. These numbers are Today's numbers, they are actually up to date with today. The leftmost column are the students we have at Beecher Road School today, and we roll them over, and we have a high projection based on the enrollment study that was done a couple of years ago for kindergarten for next year. When you apply the class size guidelines, that means that we will need seven sections for kindergarten rather than six. And the other numbers in parentheses, indicate the numbers of sections that will be necessary. If you take the long view of seven years across, you will see that we're in the mid 800s now. Uh, we're uh, projected to go downward into the low 800s and hovering around 790, 800. But remember, these are distributed across seven grades. So uh, that's why the class sections must rise by one next year and will decline again in a couple of years. And I want to point out, if you're listening very carefully, you'll notice Lynn's number was higher, 863. That's because in addition to the 840, we have 22 students in pre-K, and we have one out-of-district placed student. And I'll speak about out-of-district placements in a minute. But that number for kindergarten is what drives us when you divide these up into section counts to see that we need an additional kindergarten section for next year. Third major driver in salaries is an additional special education teacher. We had to fund an additional teacher after this year began through a grant because we had additional students, mainly in fourth grade, enter in the summer. And as you know, and has been discussed by Region 5, there are mandates related to this. And the particular grade four cohort we have has specific learning needs requiring an additional special educator. We were fortunate to fund this in a grant this year, but those needs are going to continue next year when these students are in grade five, and this grant-funded position will need to be accommodated in the operating budget. The fourth major driver in salaries is what we would call the wellness area. It is a request for an additional 1.2 social worker and a 0.1 school psychologist. If you're wondering why those odd decimals, it partially relates to some existing part-time FTE full-time equivalents we have in those areas. Uh, we've added some numbers here to justify this. We have increasing number of students who need social and emotional support to access academic learning. We have increasing numbers where the Department of Child and Children and Families is involved. We have increasing demands for psychological testing. And in fact, we are well below the ratios that a school our size should have for social work support. So this request adds some social work and a modest amount of psychology. Our fifth driver in this salaries category is an additional STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics specialist teacher. Now, when I name those five areas, I hope you're thinking that we have many students here who will pursue these as fields later. And we have currently one specialist in this area for all 850 students, which is putting our students at a relative disadvantage. So our proposal would allow for an additional STEAM specialist to enhance those areas of the curriculum and ensure all students get to the point in these areas that we all want them to be at. These salary drivers I've talked about so far are in the certified area. We also have two drivers that relate to support staff. 
from custodial maintenance to our IT manager, these positions are crucial to the operations of our school and the support of students. We have two requests in the non-certified support area of our budget. First is an additional half-time custodian. Uh, not to repeat what we talked about at the Capital Plan Committee discussion, but we are using every day lots more square footage in our building regularly. And our custodians are doing a great job, but really would benefit from additional support to ensure the health and cleanliness of every area of our building. That's the additional half-time custodian request. And then we are requesting in this proposal 10 additional teacher's assistants. Now, I appreciate when I say the number 10 followed by personnel, uh, you, you may think I have the decimal point in the wrong place. But I, I want to explain why this is on the table. You first see in parentheses, four of these would be allocated to special education one-on-one -on -one, and six for general education. What do these TAs do? Well, a special education one-to-one -one TA is mandated by law for students whose IEP indicates that they must have someone with them at all times for behavioral, emotional, or academic reasons. The bottom category, general ed TAs, these are TAs who support all of the students in the school, including the 80 some odd percent who are not receiving special education services. The, these are not clerical positions. These are vital positions working with students to meet the standards that we have. Now, you have blessed us with teaching assistance for decades, but I need to show you some interesting graphs, please. This is our total allocation of TAs over time. So over the past 10 years, this has been stable with a little bit of an increase. But I want you to see the division between general education and special education. Around 2018-19, a shift happened. And you will see that as we've had to add special education uh, TAs, most of them one-on-one -on -one TAs, we have had to take them from the TAs servicing general education to keep the total number consistent. Now, you might say or ask, why did that happen in 2018-19? It's because the district made a great decision to bring back students who had been outplaced. So when I tell you we only have one outplaced student now, there were six or eight back in 2017-18. And the cost to the district was much higher than bringing them back and supporting them. But we need to stop what we might call the erosion of general education support. Now, when you look to next year, and this is where the projection comes on the right, we already know we have to add four additional one-on-one -on -one special education TAs next year based on students who will be entering Beecher for the first time. So the orange uh, line must happen. And the Board of Education strongly supports helping to accommodate the need for special education TAs by supporting the general education students as well. So this chart represents the required increase of four special education TAs and a requested six additional general education TAs to help us get back to where we had been from about 2011 to 2019. And we won't exactly make it, but we will get closer to it. Those are the salary drivers, and I promise I can go quicker through the next ones, but we want you to have the most information possible. Uh, a lot has been mentioned about insurance by Region 5. Uh, we have been discussing at Finance Committee for the past few months that we underfunded insurance in the current year. So based on the quotations we currently have that have been used to develop this budget, a 22% increase, that's where the red line is in medical insurance, is projected for next year. Uh, that's 
13% more than we project for this year, but we've underfunded this year, which is why the 22% figure is necessary. That's the main driver there, the contractual increases applied to our census of employees. And we are fully insured just to make that contrast uh, from the prior presentation. Purchased professional services, remember that was another major part of our budget. We have projected a significant increase in legal expenses because this summer we will be conducting teacher negotiations, and that always incurs a larger legal bill for the district. And second, we uh, show an increase uh, in the building substitute category. But I make a note there that there's a somewhat proportional uh, offset in the place in our budget that supports interns. And the reason for that is it is harder and harder for districts to get interns right now. Fewer people are entering education as a profession, and it seems to us more reasonable to try to get an additional building substitute than to keep the budget open for interns that probably won't materialize. Uh, in purchased property services, we are seeing large increases in both electricity and heating costs. Uh, we have an increase here in the leases and rentals to accommodate our Apple lease, but that increase of 48,000 is offset by a $70,000 reduction in furniture. Essentially, we're leasing the computers now rather than buying them. And we have included three building improvement projects, modest ones, in the operating budget. Uh, conceivably, they could be in the capital budget, but they're not. They're here in the operating budget. Other purchased services, we are obligated to contractual increases in bus transportation and fuel. And our current fuel pricing for buses is anticipated to go up 18%. This is also, the category where I mentioned in, interns are being reduced to accommodate uh, an increase in the substitute line. And then finally, the last categories are here because they are, I don't want to say minor, they're essential parts of our budget, but in terms of dollars and cents, they reflect inflationary increases for the most part. That brings us to the overall proposal of a 15, excuse me, a 13.52 uh, proposed operating budget increase for next year. And it is important to the Board of Education. We keep gesturing forward because I hope to be your superintendent, not just this year, but in five years and 10 years, if you'll have me. And the Board of Education knows that it will be important to continue to compete well with other districts to which Woodbridge compares. And all of us have that same goal of maintaining the investment in our district. This page lists some of those areas that the board will be looking at long term. Finally, in the presentation that Karen will have to post, we have several slides here to document the revenue that we generate. We take this obligation seriously. We apply for the grant funding when it's competitive, and we also use all of the non-competitive grant money that we uh, receive from the ECS grant to a variety of recurring federal grants to smaller grants that relate specifically to the pandemic I want you to know that we are very sensitive to needing to meet the needs of the students as well as possible through every dollar, including the money we get from revenue other than local tax base. So finally, before I open it up, and you, you may very well have questions and answers, could I just say this, you, you know Mr. Taddy perhaps, this is him in our pool, and a sixth grader last year swimming with him. Uh, it's every child and every staff member every day swimming toward excellence. We are partners in that, you, me, the Board of Education, and the taxpayers. For decades, Beecher Road School has been the jewel of Woodbridge. I want to continue the conversation to help this community make it a continued gleaming jewel for the future. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions now. I know Lynn is or at any future time. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so we have some semblance of order here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest that the Board of Selectmen go first and ask questions, and then the Board of Finance will follow on it. Might as well start with our first Selectman, uh, Beth. Trying to get to my unmute button. Sorry, just take me a minute. Thank you, Matt. Um, I, I just have jotted down a few things this afternoon in thinking about this. Um, I, I've lived in town for almost 30 years. All of my three boys are graduates of Amity High School, and I credit their success with the education they received here in Woodbridge. I've always been a huge supporter of education. I fought hard for Beecher and Amity budgets, always. My concern with the large requested increase for FY23 from the Woodbridge Board of Ed is what effect will have on all other town departments. You may recall that we had a very contentious annual town meeting last year. Residents came out in large numbers asking the boards of finance and selectmen to keep the mill rate flat and not raise taxes at all. How can we justify a 13.5 increase for Beecher Road? We will have to drastically reduce every other department and probably will still not be able to keep the mill rate flat. What impact do you think this would have on all other town services that we provide? What would we have to reduce? Library services, recreation services, road plowing, paving, human services, all town departments, or even our employees. What tough choices would you have us offer? As of tonight, if we accept this, our mill rate would uh, increase to, I believe, close to 48%. I will support education and I'm willing to try to come up with solutions. We must try to work together. And I'm glad Dr. Bud mentioned us being partners. I hope we will remain partners, but we have to work together to come up with something a bit more reasonable. Thank you. Okay. Any other board of selectmen members? Go ahead. Uh, Matt, um, <clears throat> um, Dr. Bud, um, um, uh, I love our school system. My children thrive in our school system. I took them from a private school system that was very expensive to our public system, and they thrived in in our system like I'd never seen before. Um, they were comfortable. They were they were. Um, uh, uh, they were mentored in a way I had I I, I really treasured. Um, but our residents have been very clear with us. Our taxpayers have been asking us consistently and for a very long time to reduce to control our budget. Um, I. I cannot vote for a 13.5% increase for Beecher or any other department in town. I would remind you and the board that every single department, public works, police, fire, every single department going back years has tightened its budget, reduced its budget, all of which we invest in education. This is a drastic, dramatic increase in spending. I cannot get behind this. I'm sorry. Um, that's all I have to say, Matt. Okay. Any other board of selectmen? I I'd just like to um, uh, thank you, Dr. Bud. Uh, thank you, Lynn, for the presentation. It's very informative. Um, I did want to ask a specific question because you, you've heard me make the statement, I'm your liaison and I've spoken at your meetings about how this becomes a partnership. When your budget comes to the Board of Selectmen Board of Finance, we are all strong supporters of education and we are looking forward to partnering with you. At your last meeting, I had mentioned that, uh, you know, I was looking forward to what you were going to do in terms of an adjustment that was possible. So my specific question tonight is, with regard to the health insurance, I understand that no one has a crystal ball and no one is absolutely sure about what their health insurance costs are going to be. But we ask every department and we ask the town, and you've seen that Amity School District also um, is making an estimate, but they're prepared to make an estimate 
and then try to make adjustments to it that they can incorporate. Where is the Woodbridge Board of Ed and is there an opportunity for the Board of Ed to take a look once more and come back to us with a cost um, to show some good faith in the partnership here? If you don't need all of that percentage increase, this is the time to come in with a lower percent increase um, so that you're making this, this effort to sort of understand that the Board of Selectmen and Board of Finance obviously can't handle very large increases like this. So I just wanted you to, if you could briefly speak to, is it possible, could you come back to us with a, a lower number for that? I'd be happy to answer that, but perhaps Lynn would like to as well. And if, if you want to go first, Lynn, you let me know. I can go first. Okay. Um, I do believe, Sheila, that um, I, I personally, and I think that the rest of the board is 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 really um, committed to looking at the insurance costs. Our concern at the last meeting was the number that would be presented without having some definitive, um, more definitive insurance in a sense that the numbers that we were um, considering were reasonable and um, could be could be met. So um, I do believe that there is a commitment for us. And as I spoke to that, I said, I, I wanna assure you that we continue to look at this for some savings. But um, what we presented was what we know for sure now. And yes, can we can we look for some cuts? Yes, are we looking for cuts? Yes, and um, I, are committed to do that. And Jonathan, maybe you can add some more to that. Yes, I, I think having been at the Board of Education meeting, that seems like a fair statement of where the board is on that. But I uh, would also add that the board uh, unanimously supported a motion for our business office and myself to investigate all non-operational, uh, excuse me, non-instructional areas of our budget to see if there are additional savings that could be recommended and we are doing that we're starting with the other non-instructional areas such as transportation etc and we'll be bringing those to the board finance committee in february so from that perspective i believe there is there is movement uh i certainly know that many if not all of the board of education members are watching this evening or at least i believe they are and uh certainly we can bring back uh feelings from the board of selectmen and finance to them as well so I would just um, emphasize the timeline because I know there were some questions at the Board of Ed meeting about when you could change. If you don't make the change by February 1 with us, we will have what you've presented tonight and we will have to make the cuts. So if you are you have an opportunity to partner for a couple more days, and I know you have a special meeting Thursday, so if it's anything that you could do, I would definitely... Um, uh, recommend. We'll always be partners, Sheila, but I appreciate you on this point and we will take that back. Yes. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, Dr. Bud, I had a couple of questions for you. Uh, you mentioned um, some revenue. That revenue, um, is that revenue included in your 13%? Is that 13% net or is that gross offset by the revenue? Right, the 13.52 is simply the operating budget paid for through the town. Uh, it's it's not encompassed, uh, not encompassing what comes to us through the grants. So what would the net figure be? That that would be more useful, I think. Mm -hmm. I can get that for you. I just, uh, right off the top of my head, would prefer to get the figure to you separately. I mean, I, I kind of did a back of the envelope um, calculation. Looks like we're getting about a million dollars although some of those are over two years, so I couldn't figure out what we're getting this year. Right, and, and you're right to see that the title grants are for two years and basically they remain flat now. The same amount keeps coming, uh, but you're allowed to spend it over the two years, so you could essentially divide it in half. But I can get you that. I'd be happy to get the members of the board's that okay. information. The, the, sec the second thing I have, I'm looking at the, at the um, enrollment and the grade distribution. And, yes. And, you know, and... and Pre-K, first, second grade, you have 
a maximum of 20 children, well, in, in pre-K you have 19, but you have a maximum of 20 children in each class. In three through six, you have many fewer students per class. You have 17, 16 in some, in some classes, 19. Um, do you have a maximum number in those grades that you would not want to go over? Because, I mean, I'm looking at third grade and you have, if you would take one class and some 16 class a membership and split it, you would have, you know, basically 20 and 121 um, student class in that grade. And you could do that for the other higher grades as well. And each one of those would save a, an aide and a teacher and probably be over $100,000 in savings. Sure. Uh, in developing the amount of students per section, I've used the Board of Education's class size guidelines. And those guidelines uh, ask for 17 to 19 students in grades K to three and 19 to 21 students in grades four to six. So you're correct if you just dial in on grade three, that grade three as it stands uh, has one class, it's in our MAG program at 20, and that's because those students move as a group from year to year. And then the others come in at 17 or 16. And, and I think you're totally correct to say, well, that's on the low end of the range. Uh, you One could, uh, say, well, what would happen if you had one less section? And if that 20 were to continue to stay at 20, then the others would be divided into groups of 21. Uh, that would exceed the Board of Education's class size guidelines. The Board of Education would have to make a decision whether they would want to do that or not. Uh, the, the other thing I would just mention there is uh, for our entire uh, school at this point, in general education, we have about six and a half TAs. So while there used to be one grade level TA, uh, that is not the case anymore. They're more dispersed. A reduction of a class section potentially reduces a teacher. Uh, whether the Board of Education would want to do that or not, I'm not sure, but it wouldn't necessarily come with a TA exactly attached to it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, uh, Beth, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Bud and, uh, and Lynn, uh, I do understand that your school board is made up largely of, uh, members who have, uh, children in your school. And, uh, I like, I would just echo, uh, the, the sentiments and the, uh, words of Beth and Paul earlier in this conversation that I'm very concerned about the overwhelming majority of citizens in this town who do not have children in the school system. I certainly appreciate the solid gold uh, education system that, that you're running, but uh, I think that the, uh, the citizens would, would really not uh, be able to uh, stomach. You are the, uh, in the in the current run up to about 47 mil rate over our current 42 mil rate, which is still in the top 10 of all towns in this state, uh, I think that would really depress the the home values for all all the citizens, including those who love our school system but would like to see a uh, rather than the solid gold system, uh, what you could do for a gold-plated school system that is a couple of million dollars less than this. So I, uh, I, I just have to echo the sentiments of my fellow board members who, who cannot find it in themselves to uh, support a 13.5% a increase. Thank you. Anybody else on the board of selectmen? Okay, then let's go to the board of finance. Board of finance. I'll go last. I have something, Matt. That's okay. It's Ellen. Sure. Uh, thank you, Lynn and Jonathan. And I so appreciate the inspirational beginning of the presentation to ground us all in the excellence of Beecher Road School. And I think 
that's unanimous amongst all of us, how much we love Beecher and what a great job the board and the administration and the faculty and teachers are doing. Um, certainly the requested increase is startling and um, it's such a it's such a big increase to such a huge part of our budget. So I, I associate myself with the remarks of others before that um, I think we're confident that we can keep the excellence of Beecher and the gold standard of Beecher without this kind of increase. And I also want to echo the talks about partnership. We have a very, very long standing partnership between the town and Beecher Road School. And um, I want to give Tony Genovese a lot of credit for that, working all these years with Al Pulo. One of the disadvantages at this moment is I know you have a, a, a temporary budget director. I'm not sure the title that you have. So it's very different. The process has not gone along in the same way that we're used to with the town and Beecher working so closely together to come up with something that that really is what Beecher needs and what the town can afford and do. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. From what I hear from what you've said, um, you'll take advantage of that opportunity to, um, to get to the right place on this so that we support everything that Beecher needs, but we don't break the bank and, and um, really overly burden taxpayers. I just have one, Question I'd like to ask now because I know it's getting late, but on the enrollment numbers on that page, mm -hmm. um, I did look closely at the sheet we had. I know Lynn said uh, uh, 863, which you've explained the difference, but uh, what about the the general uh, trend of the numbers? They are going down. Do you see any change in that from what you've what you've given us to what you're saying today? No, the slide that you saw tonight, which Karen will distribute, reflects today's enrollment. And so, you know, really, with rare exception, the students we have move up from year to year. And the the question mark is kindergarten. But the enrollment study that we have from a few years ago based a high kindergarten enrollment on a high birth rate at that particular year. So even a, even some shades of difference on that kindergarten number will require seven sections at that level. That's that's probably a pretty much given at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Anybody? No? Matt Dwight. Yeah, okay. Dwight. Um, um, I'd like to receive my concern uh, voiced by Beth and uh, Paul and everybody else that I was absolutely stunned when I when I when I saw the increase of 13.5 percent as you can all see from last last year's meeting in May that we held it was uh it was it was it's it, it was a message sent to us very clearly by the uh by the uh, town that they that they don't want huge increases going forward or any surprises this is going to be a total shock to everybody if we accept this as is and uh I agree that if we can work together, okay, to lower this budget to a reasonable amount that that we can all live with without hurting the quality of the education. I mean, my children went through Lynn Piazic had them both in her class, so she knows it, and it's an excellent school. So and uh, and we all support it, but but it's it, but it's a it's an extremely high um, increase. Uh, okay, to, to all of a sudden ask the town when we're when we're in this budget crunch right now, and we are in a crunch. So, so we I, I think we got to work together to to try to get this down, and I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Nobody else. Yeah, I guess it's my turn. Um, <clears throat> likewise totally shocked and stunned that you would present this budget with this increase to us, um, knowing, I know you were in attendance at the town meeting, and there were people standing up and screaming at the point uh, in front of Beth, to the point where I was hoping that the police would step in. They were, these people were so wild about the budget and about their house values and keeping the mill rate down, and I just am blown away by this the amount of money you're requesting. 
I, I, I just, I'm blown away. Uh, a few points. Um, I've been doing this for 35 years, Board of Finance and Chairman just about all of those years. And never has the Board of Ed come in with an increase anywhere, anywhere near this. If I could remember, I would say maybe 7% years and years ago. But 13 point whatever it is, it's that, that, that increase, 13 point whatever, would raise taxes 1.8 mils all by itself. So someone with a house of four, worth 400000 will pay $720 roughly more for this budget. And this budget continues. I mean, once it's there, what are we going to give you next year? So it, it's inconceivable that the town in the present state could come, any, could come up with anywhere near this amount of money. I, I took the time. One other thing I want to mention, all the other boards and all the other departments came in with their budgets and have been told to come in with a 0% increase. In other words, they put their increases, in, they put their budgets in, and then they are going to have a sheet of paper, which is going to explain to the Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen how they would get to zero. That's, that's the way our thinking goes. And we're curious to see, because, you know, if, if we have to start cutting, um, we're not going to, we're not going to do it without some input, hopefully, from the, from the, the uh, the uh, departments. Um, took a little time to get some other budgets that have been put out there in, in Connecticut, just for your own, and some of these are in our dirt, I'll mention those. Bethany is currently at about 4.4%, and it's going to go down, 4.4%. Cheshire, in our dirt, 5.34%, and I know Cheshire will go down. Cheshire's uh, <laughs> always been... Uh, on top of things like that. East Hartford, 1.9%. Fairfield, Ardurg, Fairfield, 6.22%. Guilford, Ardurg, 5.9%. Now, again, a lot of these are K through 12, but I believe that the cost of educating kids 7 through 12 is a lot more expensive with athletics and honors programs and, and all the stuff that these arts, uh, that we don't have at, a, at, a, at an elementary school. Uh, Milford, not in our dirt, but 2.28%. Now, these are proposed. You know they're going to get cut. Newtown, 4.35%. I mean, are you getting the drift of this? Like a third of what we're, we're asking for. And Orange, I spoke to Orange myself uh, because I work with them. Their preliminary request is 4%, and I can guarantee you they will not get 4%. I know all the guys on the Board of Finance. There's no way. And, of course, we heard tonight from Amity, and I'm the vice chairman of the Finance Committee, and we're at 4.92%, and it's going to go down. It's going to go down. Orange last night, they met with Orange last night, and Sheila alluded to that that was on, uh, on YouTube, and it was a two-hour meeting, and they basically, Orange approved a 0.41% increase. They're going to support a 0.41% increase for Amity. I didn't do too much digging, but I'm going to give a few things I did come up with. Well, first of all, we all got the sheet from Tony, or we saw when he put it up there, that if all the requests in this budget are granted, our mill rate will go up from 42.64 to 47.61, which is an 11.65% tax increase. Let me assure anybody who's watching this and who knows me, I will not let this happen. If it happens, it's going to be because I'm overruled, but I will never let this happen. I looked at some positions. The, the um, budget the town approved for Beecher Road School for 21-22 had 132.6 positions in it. If I'm correct, and I, you can correct me if I'm not, currently there are 137.2 so almost five more people have been hired during this, this fiscal year. Requested in the, in the 23 budget is 151.9, roughly. And so from the end of last year to there, 20 positions at a time when we are trying to keep taxes under control, Beecher Road School is going to increase by 20 people. And it just that just blows me away. It blows me away. Um, so with all that, I, I, I agree completely with Sheila. You've got to come back to us 
with something. I mean, if you don't, here's what happens. If you don't come, if you're going to come in and stick with this 13.8% or whatever it is, the Board of Selectmen will meet sometime in February. And they will go over all the budgets and make whatever cuts they deem necessary. From there, it comes to us, the Board of Finance. And basically the way we work it is I sit down with Tony and I speak to the first selectman, and, and we then formulate the budget that we believe overall the town will or can support. And I can assure you that if, if we're going to start at 13 point, it's going to, I don't know what it's going to go to, but um, we're going to keep taxes under control. And uh, unfortunately, there's no way we can even come close to 13.8%. So either Either Beecher comes back and, and we have a better starting point than 13.8, or we're going to do it for you. Um, but there's no way we can afford 13.8 or 9.6 or, or whatever. We can't. We can't afford it. At least, at least not. If, if you were at that town meeting and you heard, I've had a dozen phone calls already. For that, that there was an article in the paper that uh, in the Woodbridge Town News that mentioned this 13.8 percent. I had a dozen phone calls from people saying, "You got to be kidding me. You're not going to support this, are you?" And I said, no, <laughs> but uh, he said, when, when? We've never seen an increase anywhere near this. I got, and this is, as, as uh, David Vogel said, this is a, a relatively new board. And all of them, from, from what I can gather, except for probably Lynn, have kids in the school. And so, uh, you know, I mean, I, I've, always had a, I've always had an issue when you're elected to a board, be it the Board of Education, be it the Zoning Board, be it whatever board. Police commission, fire commission. You have an obligation not only to the commission, but to the taxpayers. I mean, they're the ones that voted you in. You have to think of the taxpayers. And I'm sorry, there is no way presenting a budget, an increase of 1.9 million or whatever it is, two million dollars, respects the taxpayers. I'm sorry. I, I hate to be so blunt, but that is what I believe. Um, You've got to go back and, and, like I said, you could leave it leave it the way it is. And and if you're if you're um, if the M uh, Woodbridge Board of Education says no, that's it. Give it okay. Then then you're going to leave it up to us. And I don't think that's a good idea. So uh, I hate to be so blunt, but I, I we represent thousands of taxpayers, and um, the vast majority of them don't have kids in Beecher Road School. And the, a, a really high majority of them are retired. A lot of people are retired. So to to burden, to, to, to come up with a tax increase of 1.8 mils just for Beecher it is never going to happen. So I don't know what else to say. Uh, I hate to be so blunt, but I am. And because this is what I've been doing for 35 years, never had to do anything to this magnitude. But so we will see. We will see. And if anybody else has anything to say, please say so now. Okay, anybody else? No? Okay, Jonathan and, uh, and uh, Lynn, thank you very much. And we'll Matt, I can you assure know. you, Matt and Beth, I can assure you, Lynn and I will take your uh, comments back to the Board of Education. As I say, I think most or many of them are watching this evening and uh, we will be back in touch based on their direction. Okay, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. We got a we've got a, a lot of um I guess Tony, you're gonna be doing most of these um Yes. Okay. So yes. Just Beth my... is gonna Beth's gonna start on the board of selectmen, but all the others I will take care yeah, of. Let me just get my stuff. Budget books get heavier and heavier every year, don't they? Uh, the first uh, <laughs> we're running a little late. Karen Karen was very uh conservative with her time. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm looking at seven o'clock. The first uh, department is the Board of Selectmen, which is Department 1110. I guess I can yep. find it. Yep. Hold on a second. I'm just going to highlight a couple of uh, two uh, categories that are priorities for me, um, communications and community. Um, the town continues to publish the newsletter for a year, for 10 times a year. This goes to about 3,000 homes. And it's also published on the town website. It's a simple and consistent way for town departments to commemorate, communicate with all residents. We also publish the e-newsletter 
and is needed, but that goes to people who have chosen to share their email addresses. And we have, I guess, at this point, about 2,500 email addresses, which allows us to communicate more frequently. And um, especially during COVID, it's been an invaluable service, reaching out to folks and letting them know what's going on, if there's an emergency or things like that. Um, I'm gonna try to continue to hold community events. I'm hoping in the spring, um, they'll get more, more frequent because we can be outdoors. We're, gonna, we're still working on an Earth Day and the community council is gonna plan a community bike ride to celebrate the town's new bike route. I think that will be happening in May. These events will become annual events along with the Diversity and Inclusion Committee's Woodbridge Like Me Day, which was first held last fall and was a tremendous success. It's also important for our community's quality of life to bring residents together to celebrate each other. Another quality of life issue is blight. We've hired a part-time blight officer and this budget represents the second full year of that. As the Board of Selectmen saw at a presentation in December, this person has resolved some longstanding issues amicably and successfully, and I believe we kept it in the budget because we thought it was important. Most of our regional services support town staff in a professional capacity, such as the SCROG, South Central Regional Council of Governments, Connecticut Conference of Municipalities. I can list them all, but in the interest of time, there's a lot of them. If you need me to repeat, list them. There's probably about 20 of them. I will do it, but I'm just going to rush through this. Um, let's see. Um, Amity Teen Center continues to serve local teens in the Amity School District. However, they have expanded the mission. We had a meeting with them today and are now doing business at, as 10 Selden. They're now hosting Woodbridge Arts Guild, which is planning two upcoming art shows. One is intergenerational and one will be for Amity, the Amity Art Society. It's been very successful. This additional service will boost the town's cultural offerings. Last item I want to highlight is a town planner. I would like to hire a professional to help us with some planning activities to make the town more business friendly, bike and pedestrian friendly and community friendly. And we all have ideas on how to improve our town. I think a planner would help us synthesize the best ideas and find a way to realize them. So I would hope y'all would consider funding this budget. We do have a zero percent. I don't know where is that. I was just going to ask you: Do you have? There's one. No, you don't have to give it. We don't have to go over it now. If we get so to, on the zero percent. We, we did zero, it. maybe Tony can speak to that. We do have it, so. Okay. Yeah, the, so the the uh, the difference in the uh, the budget's about $25,000. $20,000 is in there for a planner. Okay. So that would be most of it, and then there would be some assorted cuts to um, probably some of the supply accounts to get to the um, zero. Okay. Just want to make sure everybody's. So what I hope, what I'd like to, what I'm going to do is print a, uh, provide a, a summary sheet of all of the uh, proposed cuts by department for all the departments that have suggested them. So you have an easy reference. Good. Good idea. Okay. I hope they have any that. Your questions, any questions on the board of select or budget? Yeah, Good. I've got a couple of, a couple of questions here. Um, I noticed that the first selectman has given herself a 2.4% raise. I think if we're trying to keep the budget down, um, that is, um, how shall I say, um, a little tone deaf, to say the least. The same thing goes for the um, the professional town council who got himself a $5,000 raise, which is about 8%. I don't know how you can justify those two items in that budget. I will say this. Um, I, haven't, I haven't taken a raise for four years, I'll tell you that. <laughs> So, that hasn't ever taken an increase. So I guess this is the first year you're taking one. Right. Yeah, I'm thinking that maybe should I not be here forever in my entire life? Who knows? But um, this is not going to be an attractive salary. If Tony, we talked about this a little bit. So, you know, two and a half percent doesn't even track inflation. That's pretty much what every other town department uh, person got, right, Tony? That's everything. Correct. That's the uh, annual, that's what the cost of living yeah. adjustment is. Yeah, but those, those other folks are supporting families on that money. Um, I don't think you're in that position. I mean, it's a choice, Beth. And and what you're you're saying is, you know, I deserve to have a 2.4 percent increase. And you know, you can you can say that. And I think people will listen to that and make this decision about, you know, whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. But the same thing goes for, you know, our town council. I see forty-five thousand dollars in legal services. Beyond that. $36,000 in labor negotiations, um, and we're paying 
our council $90,000. I don't know what he does for the $90,000. I'm not privy to all the things that he does, but I think that's an item that also needs to be He has been here. invaluable to me. I will tell you that. And a lot of the things that we've done over the last yeah. four and a half years, um, I, I can talk to him 10, 12 times a day and get through things. It's, it's invaluable. And uh, I think he's worth it. And uh, as far as labor negotiations, um, we have contra okay. uh, next year in this budget, okay. we have um, both of our contracts are um, up June 30th of 20, the uh, end of this uh, budget, 2023. So we will begin contract negotiations starting in January of next year. So we need some funds for that. The council, council doesn't do that? We have, uh, no, we have a um, separate council that specializes in that sort of negotiation. Um, Matt, can I just say something to that? I I certainly don't think that the first selectman salary should be based on need. It should be based on the job uh, that the person does and, you know, comparisons perhaps to other towns. But to suggest that um, the, the financial situation of any of our employees determines their salary, I don't think is the right way for us to approach it. I can also tell you, I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but I know when I was first selectman, our town councils number was well below other towns uh, compared to what other towns are spending. And some of our needs are very specific and require uh, specialized counsel. And that, that's a different cost. But um, I, can, I can assure you, at least traditionally, it's been quite low. So um, I just want to be on the record for those. So, Thank you. you know, speaking to that, when you had, a, you had a town council for that low number, you didn't have any, any trouble finding somebody to fill that bill. I'm not sure what you're saying, but yes, that's correct. We, we, right. <laughs> right. I mean, I think I would, if I could just chime in here for a second and say that I, I, I have to say that, you know, I think it's important to discuss everything, but the idea that, that a salary um, is based on the financial circumstances of the job holder really doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, okay. That point. And I do think that we also have to consider that we, that if our salaries are not commiserate with other positions in the surrounding area, then we are not going to get good candidates going forward. That doesn't mean we can't have these discussions, but I think we have to be very careful that that you don't put us in a position where we can't we don't get good candidates running for office because we're not tracking what salaries are. You pay pe people for what their the job is. And and you do the best job you can on it. And uh, let's not get distracted by other things. Anything else on? Yeah, Matt. Uh, this is Dave. This is Dave yeah. Vogel. Uh, uh, this is my first look at our board of. Although I'm on the board of selectmen, this is really my first look at it. And I I realize that it's. Uh, I I would have to agree that I don't think looking at individuals and and talking about the, the, those people's salaries however if we look at each of these line items as can we get this done for less uh it, it then you know whether we can get you know overtime we don't have overtime clerical but whether we can get clerical for less whether we can get uh regional services for less any of these line items that we can do for less Shouldn't we consider that? I mean, uh, I, I don't want to talk about an individual salary, but is, can we get professional town council service for less? Uh, these are just all things that, uh, for me, it, it, I'm looking at, at just line items. I'm not looking at people. And, and I'm just in the favor, as a member of the Board of Selectmen, in doing everything we can to come in and set an example for everybody's sacrifice in this town. Uh, all the commissions and and boards and and the and all the places where we spend our money, I think the board of selectmen should do everything they can to come in at a zero budget figure, uh, because I think we owe that to the town. And if we can't do that, if we can't hurt a little bit, uh, if the town can't hurt somewhere as simple as the board of selectmen, and we're pretty close, uh, you know, we're not sending the right message. 
and then we will see 14% uh, in, increases coming from outside. And, you know, I've looked at what's happening in the last 10 years, and I know that our town, our, we've, we've shrunk. Town shrunk in every area. All of the, all of the uh, financial area, the operating budgets that we're looking at are showing fewer people working than they had 10 years ago. We've asked everybody to tighten their belts. I think the only people, the only places that have more people working are the school systems. And, and I just think, you know, if we can't set a better example, we're, how, do we, how do we ask other people to do the quality work that we expect to be done for the citizens of this town with fewer people and less money. And uh, so I would like us to really work hard to get to a zero budget uh, for the Board of Selectmen. And that being said, I, I really do think we, Beth, I, I agree with you, we need that town planner. I don't know how we work it into the budget, but uh, you know there are things that, that we are gonna have to give up. And I think we have to question our own uh, you know, our own motives, our own whatever we bring to the table and keep asking ourselves if this isn't time to change the way we're thinking about some of these things. And uh, uh, I hope that this is one where where we can really take the lead and say, look, this is this is a tough time for our town. we got to go to zero budget. Thank I, you. Can, I can tell you, as far as regional services, we get billed for those, such as Council of Governments. It's all based on per capita, I believe, Tony. Is that correct? See, so those kind of things we can't, we're, we're, unless we lose people, it's not going to change in some of those services. But I'm willing to go back and take a look and see what we can do. I'm sorry. Well, certainly, certainly, you're going to get your, David, you're going to get your crack at it when, uh, when the Board of Selectmen meet. So this, this could be the first one. You give it to us with zero, we're good. <laughs> so, okay. Next is, um, any, any other questions on Board of Selectmen? Okay, probate court, of course, is contractual. It's only $9,500, and that is a 0% increase. So, have no choice in that. Yeah. Right. Next is uh, general administration, 1140. Of course, the bulk of this is insurance. Um, insurance, right. We had an increase earlier. A lot of this is um, just passing through the increase that we had in the current year yeah. that we had to do earlier in this year. And a lot of that relates to cyber. Insurance, you heard that earlier by uh, the Amity made that uh, distinction, and um, and also our, our umbrella is up a little, and so uh, we will con we of course are going to bid this service and we uh, seek pricing and we will we constantly update this figure, so uh, this is something that we will uh, stay tuned on as the year goes on. Generally, with these types of things, we are more conservative, and then as we get closer to the um, end of the year, we get a better, more refined uh, figure. So, looking at this one, how do you get this to zero? It's all utilities and insurance. It's really difficult, isn't it? Yes, this one is. Um, I mean, obviously, there's drastic things you can do, but you would have to cut back your insurance. Yeah, yeah, you can't, right? I mean, if that if if, so if the electric if the electric is what it is, it's probably going up. Um, it's going down. Actually, you're going to see a trend of electricity going down oh, in yeah. uh, a few of our accounts. It is because if uh, those of you who were on the board a few years ago, if you remember, uh, we did some uh, zero percent financing of some electric, uh, some um, fixture improvements through UI. So it was a program where we paid for um, updates to mostly LED lighting in um, four of our building. It was at the um, center building, at the uh, public works facility, at the firehouse, uh, and at the town hall. And at Beecher School also did some work. And so um, very, they had various payback times and uh, some of them are starting to pay off. So you can see here, you'll see it at the firehouse uh, and you'll see it at um, the center building. Uh, the, um, the loan is paid off, which was a zero interest loan. So now you're realizing the savings of the uh, fixture updates. So okay. that's why well, it's that's, down. We'll keep it in mind. It's not that big a deal. It's, uh, what is it? Uh, 30, uh, 30, 38,000, something like that. Yeah, you'd have to, you'd have to. Um, That'd be tough. That'd be tough. Unless the insurance comes in. Insurance. Unless yeah. insurance, insurance comes, comes in lower. Less, and that's probably not going to happen. So we have an umbrella policy for 10 million and we have a second umbrella for 20 mil, an extra 10 million. Yeah. If you take off that second $10 million umbrella, you, you could probably come pretty close. Yeah, that's something you got to think about. Yeah. 
Okay. Any questions on general administration? Then let's move on to information systems. Um, it's 1145. That's an 8.22% increase. Yeah, the information system is suffering from um, what you've all have heard, I'm sure, throughout your own um, uh, uh, you know, research, is that um, cybersecurity is a big theme in this budget. We have um, um, multi-factor authentication, which is part of our increase in software upgrades. We're rolling that out to our staff. I'm sure all of you do that in um, other areas, and we have that here at the town. Um, we have a lot of our software maintenance contracts are passing through cybersecurity upgrades through their um, the maintenance contracts, and um, that includes our financial package and our tax <clears throat> package and some of the other financial packages, uh, other packages. We have a rec track for recreation, and um, so that's a lot of, uh, of the software maintenance costs. And um, the telephone line is for Internet access, and we've increased our offsite data storage to accommodate for, um, again, a cybersecurity risk. So that, that's a pretty much a common theme in this budget. Yeah, well, trust me, a $14,000 increase is not gonna make or break the town, especially when it's vital stuff like this, so. I mean, um, I, I, I can't stress enough how important it is oh, for us to of course. maintain. But I mean, you can, you know, cut back your your protections and, and take a risk. Well, you know, that's, well, let's see where we end up with all these yeah. other departments. This is not one we worry about. So any questions on information systems? Next is the finance department, which is a nice, a reduction of 14.21% in labor and a uh, 0.94% increase. Um, I'm sure you can get this to zero if we want to. We, we could probably have to cut back. Dollars. It's a $3,000 increase. See, what's, and, uh, um, what's with this? What's with the reduction in salary? Did we move somebody out, or so there's a reduction in uh, banking? Oh, okay. And so um, we've restructured some of our our fees, and um, we've been able to um, save uh, a considerable amount of money in our uh, banking operations, and we've restructured some of our services, and um, so that's sort of how we've gotten that down. Tony, one thing I forgot to mention when I was speaking on the Board of Ed, over the past three or four years, how much have all the other departments grown? I know we talked about this. It's like so, um, or if, it's, if you go from 2016 to 2021, it was, uh, I believe that was an actual reduction. Reduction. Of the town departments, right? So the town departments have actually are smaller in 2021 than they were in 2016. When you add 22 in there, I think it's a two or th maybe a 3% increase, 4% right. increase, somewhere in that neighborhood. Right. So that's over seven years, six, seven years. Right. And so it's because- you, Well, while we give more to both education systems, I mean, you know, Amity is no inexpensive increase too, but- And the main reason the is- Education systems, the rest of all the town departments have done more with less. And the main reason is, which was it was indicated, uh, I think David mentioned, is that we've cut a lot of positions. Right. So that's how we, that's the only way to get that drastic of a reduction. Right. Yep. Any questions on the finance department? Okay. Uh, former firehouse. Jeez. Eleven ninety one. Former firehouse. So that's. This is a status quo budget, which um, 10,792, no increase. Right. This right. doesn't contemplate a, uh, any use of the firehouse. Right. So if there's any use of the firehouse, should that ever um, take place, that you'd have to re-examine this. But as of right now, it just contemplates its existing state. Okay. I, I'm sure, I'm sure, what do you have a question on that? And then finally, uh, the Thomas Darling House, which is 1540. Thomas Darling House is um, operating costs related to the operation of the Darling House. And uh, this is actually a pass through. The yeah. um, Historical Society reimburses us in our revenues for this expenditure. So you'll see a corresponding uh, $7,050 in our revenues for um, revenues oh. from the, yeah. 
So it's it's essentially a wash. Okay. Any questions on that? Well, we had a rather ambitious meeting tonight. A lot, a lot. Putting both boards of education in one night is was never easy. Um, but a lot of you really kind of put them side by side. For uh, Thursday, we have a whole bunch of departments. I'm sure you have the schedule. So um, Thursday, we're starting at six o'clock, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you, and uh, have a good evening. Good night, everybody. Good night. 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 Good night.